Hello, welcome to the February 17th, uh, 2023 Club Cubase live stream. My name is Greg Undo and I'm the host of the live stream. Um, and if you, I'm presenting, I work as an employee for Yamaha Corporation of America, uh, basically as a product specialist. Uh, and I'm the host and I'm presenting from outside of Washington DC area in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, and if other people, excuse me, let me just mute the source here quickly. All right, let's mute my monitoring computer. Uh, so, and again, I'm the host of, uh, so, uh, um, so I'm the host of the live stream. And if you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can submit questions in advance or simply, uh, send an email to club cubase at steinberg.de. Um, and that will, especially if it's maybe a little more involved, um, uh, and, um, if, so, and we should have all of the top topics that are covered in today's live stream actually pinned to the top of the comments field with timestamps. So you could look for that. Um, also, when asking questions, realize that I'm, that my ability to actually ask to answer questions in a real time manner will soon be eclipsed with as questions start to roll in. Uh, so if you don't see an immediate response to your question, uh, what you could do is just simply, uh, if we could try to avoid asking the same questions, uh, and repeat the same questions that just kind of slows down the whole process, that would be helpful. Um, when asking questions, if you could specify which level of Cubase that you're running, so whether you're running Cubase, uh, LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, which version numbers, so if it's 10, 10.5, 11, or 12, or and which operating system that you use, that information will be helpful. Uh, if you wanted to search for topics that have been covered in previous live streams, you could go to um, cubaseindex.com, and Jan from Stockholm has automatic has been kind enough to create that website for us. Uh, so as we're um, so you could check that out, and we want to give a special thanks to Jan for that. Uh, we also have uh, a number. Uh, we have two people that serve as moderators on the live stream. So we want to give a special thanks to Agent K and Jazz Dude. They're not employees of Steinberg in any way. They just do it to kind of make it a better community. So we'll give a special thanks to them. Uh, one other wonderful resource of information that's available is the Cubase Nation Discord. And Jazzdo does a lot of work to compile information for that, so uh, we'll give him an extra special thanks today. And with that, we will go ahead and get started. Um, so we see a question. Um, could you show us how to make a collaboration project? Um, so you could go you know, to any of your projects. If we go to the VST Cloud menu and go to VST Transit, I think I'm logged in already. And what we could do at, at this point is uh, you could upload like the active project if you wanted to. We could come over and you could share projects. You could find friends and be able to at this point uh, just you know invite people to collaborate. So you could see if your friends you know that are also Steinberg users, you could find them. And at this point, just say, okay, I want to, you know, do this. And once we have the projects, we could choose which particular tracks within a project uh, are visible to them and which could be uploaded. So someone could do editing, upload the changes, and then you could download and sync the projects together. So check out the VST Transit feature. All right, so a question. Uh, Greg, what programs do you use to broadcast and record live? So the program I use for doing the live streams uh, is I just use uh, just OBS, which is freeware. So I set up to have a audio source. And at this point, we also have, a, I just set it up for display capture. Uh, you get kind of the, uh, like the ID for your YouTube page and then you just kind of like your streaming key and then you enter that information in and then uh, from within YouTube once it sees OBS is streaming to it at that point you could just do the live function so I just use OBS when I create tutorials that aren't broadcast I use ScreenFlow for that uh, you could use OBS for that as well 
Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is there an easiest way to save a little change made on a preset than searching and overriding presets name, Cubase 12 Pro? So if we have a particular preset, so let's say I'll just add an audio track and we'll go to like an insert effect. Okay, so if I wanted to make an ever, let's say I'll load up a preset here. And I like that, so let's say I tweak it and all I would have to do is just go to the preset management and save the preset. So we'll just call this February 17th. So now when we go to all of your available presets, you can just see that February 17th, 2023 will be right in there. So if you wanted to say, you know, dry drums and put your initials or whatever. So, you know, once you made any changes, all you had to do is again, just come over make and just click on save preset. And then you could just save that and it'll show up in your list. It'll also show up in your, uh, if you go to media, and we'll go to home and we'll say user presets and we'll say, okay, let's go to, uh, you know, VST effects presets. And then we'll see February 17th, 2023 that we just kind of created right there for that particular plugin. All right. Wonderful to see David Griffiths on and we have Benny from Sweden. <clears throat> We're glad you could join us despite your is feeling sick. We hope you get better soon. All right, so we see uh, Alexander Plasco checking in from uh, Connecticut and says he's surprised with the Hallian 7 grace period. If anyone can do FM, uh, it certainly is Yamaha. So, yeah, um, I kind of fought hard for the grace period to include, you know, because we did a promotion for Absolute uh, around November. So we wanted to make sure that all those people didn't buy, you know, that we wanted to, you know, we kind of fought hard to make sure that all those people would be eligible for the grace period just to kind of do the right thing for the customer. All right. So we see a question, uh, from David Griffiths, uh, says Cubase artist 12 windows 11. I can't change first and subsequently created color shades of arranger blocks as I create new ones on the arranger track. Um, the arranger track doesn't inform them. I saved them as part of a template, uh, but they always revert to brown color and shades thereof. So if you're saving it as a template, let me just go ahead and we'll just see if we could save this as a template and see what happens with the colors. So we'll add an arranger track. Okay, so let's say I have these colors here. Okay. Okay, so let me just go ahead and change colors. Let's say we'll make that one red. We'll make this one and we'll just kind of go through the order of the colors. Okay, so let me just save this as a template. Okay, I'm gonna close this project. And we'll say, we'll just, we'll get to new project and we'll come over to we'll activate it now. So it seems like it's the 
colors in order. So let me know if I did something differently than you did or if I'm misunderstanding the question, David. All right, so we have a question. Uh, how do I make a folder where I can have all my favorite presets in Howling in 7 so I could quickly access them? So you may not need a folder. So let's say if we go to uh, Howling in 7, which was just released yesterday, so a lot of people have been wondering when. I said I could probably have a good answer for you today. So the answer is when Howling in 7 is going to be released is yesterday. So let's come over here to VST Instruments. And let's go to Halion 7. All right, so when I come over to, there's a rating system. So I'm gonna just open this up. We'll do, let's say, just a single instrument. Uh, so as you kind of go through different presets, what you could do is at this point, just say, okay, I really like this one. I like this one. I like this preset. Um, and then you could just say, okay, I want my five-star presets. I want three-star presets. I want four-star. So you could just kind of pick and choose, okay, I just want three and greater. So at this point, I just want five-star. So maybe just come over here and use the rating system. And you could just, instead of having to go to a folder, you could at this point just click and say, okay, I'm looking for my favorites are five stars. So as you play it, instead of saving into a folder, just kind of go to the little stars here and just kind of add stars accordingly and do the rating. And then you'll be able to just say, find my favorites, which are five star or four star sounds. And so give that a try. I'm glad that you're liking Howling in 7. I think it's a pretty amazing program too. Going back to college, learning FM synthesis again. All right, wonderful to see Matt Elston checking in. We have Patrick also live from India. Okay, so we have uh, Hans uh, Mittendorf ask, uh, can you talk about automation, please? Okay, so let me just go to a different project. Sorry. Okay, so I'm not sure if there's any particular questions you have in automation, but we'll show you some stuff. Okay, so let's say I have uh, just my drum part here, and I'll just solo only this one particular track. And we want to do automation. So I'm going to open up my automation lane so we could see the automation lane directly underneath. And this way we could see multiple automation passes. Uh, let's go open the fader for the particular channel. And I'm going to click on W to write the automation, which will also enable read the R to read back the automation. So. Now I want to automate the parameters. And there's different automation modes. So we have touch, there's auto latch and crossover. So touch will allow us to automate like as we're touching kind of different components. As soon as I release the mouse, the automation stops writing. If we switch this to auto latch, um, we could have the automation when I let go of the mouse automatically continue to write the automation until I hit stop. And that will keep that value and put the point at the end. Uh, we also have crossover. So if we have an automation value here and we have crossover, I can now just kind of have it kick out as soon as we reach a particular threshold. Uh, now to edit automation data in, you know, there's also an automation panel, which you get access by hitting F6. So if you wanted to see like the waveforms in the automation lanes, and if you wanted to only see 
you know, show only volume or show panning automation on all tracks or show used automation on all tracks or hide all automation. We have controls for that. Um, and just being able to kind of edit particular automation points. So if I wanted to uh, raise all the automation up a bit, or if I wanted to raise it kind of at, have it get louder as it goes on or softer as it goes on, or if we wanted to expand or compress the contents, we could do that right here. We could copy automation if we wanted to. Uh, as we move an event, the automation for that event by default will be tied to the particular event. So I think we could just do that by enabling automation follows events. But if you have like specific questions, feel free to let me know. But that's a quick kind of overview, of some stuff you could do in automation. All right, wonderful to see Robbie Bowling from Dallas, Texas. All right, so we see from Jovanovic 3D says, uh, Halion 7 is finally here. FM Lab is amazing. So, yeah, I think they did a, they kind of hit it out of the ballpark with that one. So, it's great to have, you know, so many, you know, sampler, anal virtual analog, you know, FM, wavetable, you know, like so many, and, you know, tone wheels, <laughs> oscillator. So, all that within one particular program is pretty amazing all right so we see uh dallas larue asks um mike chatfield just jumped uh so dallas larue asks what does this term what does the term stem mean is it a track that has been rendered so often if you know people refer to stems as being kind of a way so that all of the files could easily be uh, like, you know, imported into a different program. So if we had files that were something like this, um, you know, and we wanted to turn this into a stem and let's say this was the length of the particular project, you know, this is the beginning and the end. And so often a stem will be one contiguous audio file for the entire project. So you don't have, you know, edits and different different files going in and out. So if you now want to create a stem, we could go to like audio to uh, bounce selection and we could replace the events. So this would be a stem of all the particular files. So generally a stem and it, there's different definitions whether it has processing like the effects embedded or not. Uh, but generally it's gonna be where all files are equal lengths so that someone could drop it into any other program and say started this time and have it play back. So that's generally kind of what a stem is, is one contiguous file that it, that kind of includes all the different audio events on a particular track. So, but, and often you do that through rendering. So there's often an association there between stems and rendered files. All right, so we see from uh, Balsa from Montenegro says big shout out to you and all the things you do for us. So I'm just glad I could be helpful. Thank you so much for the kind words. It's always appreciated. All right, so we see from uh, Eric. It says uh, just updated to Halion Seven. Can I delete the old Halion Six content folder? Thanks. You know, generally, I think, you know, how, you know, there's a lot of common content between them. So even if you installed it all, it may not have installed. So I think that the Halion 7 is automatically reading all of your Halion 6 content. So I would just leave it there unless you see that you have like the same files in the content folder that are duplicated. Um, but, you know, so a lot of times it may install all the content because it doesn't know that you're upgrading or that you've had all of the different instruments installed in the past. All right, uh, so we see Greg uh, had a, from Patrick, um, says Greg had a looped section, I played it and had 10 take lines but I want all 10 takes uh, to be arranged on a single track horizontally. Is it possible? 
Okay, so let me just create this scenario here. All right, so let's say, drop these in. All right, we'll put these onto different tracks. All right, so let's say we wanna take, this event and move it um, so I think that there is kind of like a selected track um, let's see if it's under move okay so let's say if we come here and we'll just say um, move events to separate tracks, so it will say move to selected track. All right, and let's see if I have my cursor here and we say move to selected track. All right, so I'll see if I could do this without spending a bunch of time making a macro, but I think we could maybe do this. Okay, so if we have this selected, um, Okay, so maybe I want to we'll say we'll create a new macro and let's see if we can do this quickly. Okay, so let's add I think if we go to say move Okay, and we'll select this and add it. All right, so let's say if we try run the macro, so we could do something like this.
So if, and let me just check the macro one more time, but so we could add like, you know, a measure between it. Make sure I get that last function in. find a function one more time here. Okay, so let's say if I'm here, I may have to play around with the macro somewhat, but you could. Okay, I'll try one tweak of the macro here. Move this up. Okay, so if I have this selected, Just see if we can so I, I'll play around with the uh, the macro a little bit, but I think if we get this event selected. see if we move this to origin or move this to the select a track. Okay, I'll try one more tweak to the macro. And we'll move on after this. All right, I think it's our last attempt here. So let's say if I have this selected, and now we'll run the macro. Yeah, I'll, I'll play around with this more, Patrick, if you wanna email me, but I think we can get it. I may have to kind of play with the selection and then come over here and move to macro, but you could take Kind of, kind of, kind of all of the events here, and let's say if we go move to selected track, it's going to do kind of one, one event at a time. Um, but let's say if we have all of these, 
and let's say if I have those, let's see if we can go to edit. Let's go to functions and set the spacer between events if that. Okay, so, um, so if you just come over here and move it to the selected events, you could, you know, move the particular track uh, to, so move that to the selected track. So even now, if we just say move to selected track. Okay, so we'll just come over here. So we we'll say edit, move to selected track, edit, move to selected track. Right, and then let's say we have these all stacked on top of each other. Then if you wanted them spread out, just select all the events and go to edit to functions and set spacer between events and I have two seconds and that will automatically space them all out so they're not stacked on top. So give that a shot, Patrick. And I could tweak the macro and maybe show it on Tuesday's live stream. Okay, just going through, reading through questions. All right, so we see John Kosigan has hit the like button on the way in, so that's good. Thank you. John's from Kenosha, Wisconsin. All right, and we have D.L. White checking in from Texas. All right, so we see, uh, hi, how to, from Command Beats, uh, hi, how to master loudness. You know, so if you're looking for like a delivery standard on, you know, like reaching a target level, you know, one of the things that you could do is, let me just find, I got like a two track project. You know, so once you've done your mix down, if you're looking, you know, to reach a particular loudness level with a project or with the file, let's say for your mix. So let's say uh, you could go to audio and go to processes and there's a normalize and a normalize most normalizes will allow you to work at, you know, by peak normalizing. Uh, but here we could actually have it as a loudness normalize. So you could do loudness normalization for your target and for most streaming services, that'll be minus 14 LUFs. Um, so if you're just looking to get your mix, uh, you know, set for the correct level, try just again, go to audio to processes and go to normalize. And at that point, just do your loudness normalization at the LUFs value that's kind of required for wherever you're delivering to. All right, so we see Peter just having a, another snowy day in Montreal. So yeah, we've only had like a quarter inch of snow this whole season. So it's been a, kind of a disappointing winter in Washington DC area if, if you like snow. All right, so we see a question from Patrick. Uh, how to organize all tracks with Project Logical Editor? Like I want to select all render tracks, send to folder, all MIDI tracks which are muted because it's rendered, send to separate folder. Um, okay, so let's say if we have, um, let's say, will I have, four MIDI tracks or, or instrument tracks. Let me just adjust the height there. Um, okay, so let's say we want to do muted tracks and let's say uh, if we did uh, like a render in place, I'll just add an event here. All 
Okay, so let's say if I have these um, particular events and let's say I've rendered them. So I'll just do a quick render in place. So we could edit to render in place. So let's say we'll do a complete signal path. All right, let me just change my settings. I think I did set to bounce down. Okay, so I don't want to mix down. We won't use a specific name. Okay, so let's say these, I didn't have it set to mute, but let's say I, I wanna take muted MIDI tracks and put them into a folder. So let's see if we can do that in a project logical editor. So we will, uh, we'll transform or let's select and we'll say media type is equal to MIDI um, and property is set to event is muted and let's select the tracks to new folder. Okay, so let's say um, now I just want to take muted MIDI tracks and put them into a folder. So let's see if this Just say I have this selected. All right, I'm gonna see if we just have this selected right. So say our track is, container type is a track. Okay, wait, okay, I think I see, okay. All right, so I think I had to disable, so let me do the render in place one more time, sorry about that. and we'll mute the source tracks. Okay, so, so now I have this, we can property is set to mute it. All right. So now, okay, so I'm gonna come here. I have my audio track selected and I wanna take my muted tracks and put them into a folder. So we could do it just like that. Um, and let's say like if we have tracks that are based on um, so right now we can take all of our muted tracks and put that into its own dedicated folder. And if we wanted to take, uh, tracks that have the, like the parenthesis R, so we can say name contains like R for the render. and put those into a folder. So now we'll 
all these tracks with those particular name characters characterizations are now in their folder if you wanted to so give that a try so so let me know if that is what you wanted to do patrick All right, wonderful to see um, um, Michael Marshall checking in from Somerset in the UK. We see from OEW Howling in 7 is just wonderful, so it's great. All right, so we have a question from Jose Antonio Gazzo. Uh, is there a way to look, mi to look MIDI tracks in a one-note only way? Um, so I'm not sure what... Uh, like, like what look MIDI tracks in a one note only way means. Uh, maybe Jose, if you could ask your question, uh, in, in a different way. So I'm not sure if you wanted to only see like one, like when we look at an event here, if you want to only see one MIDI note, if that's what you, what you mean by look MIDI note, look, uh, look MIDI tracks in one note only way. Uh, but let me know if that's what you mean, if it's just a visual display. Uh, I think if we go to, and if that's the case, I think there's some settings. I'm not sure if it's going to just put one MIDI note in it, but it's a good event display MIDI tracks. Um, so if you don't want to see data, we could have that by part data mode. We could have lines. Or you could see like score editor, if you wanted to get like a score view or what a drum grid would look like or blocks. So, but let me know if I'm, you know, what look MIDI tracks in a one note only way means. All right, so a question from Arnold. Uh, hi, is there a possible is it is it possible to protect MIDI events from altering but still keep it visible? I want to edit a track and keep other tracks visible for reference. Okay, so let's say I'm going to make this kind of an obnoxious red color, and I'm just going to take these particular my twentieth twenty first century composition here. I date myself saying twenty twentieth century composition. All right, so let's say. I want to look at both of these events. So one of the things you could do is probably just to lock, you know, the we could lock um, the particular events. So let's see if we lock it here. And then we want to look at both of these events in our key editor. And let's look at, make sure I, to see if it's if we lock it okay I'm gonna switch the color to so we could see it a little easier so let's do it colorize by part okay so let's say I'm going to unlock the track but let's Lock, let's say, the position and size. Okay, so I'm gonna select these two events and let's go into our key editor. So these, uh, my red, let's see if, if when we're in the editor, if, let's check. Okay, so I think that locks the, let's try position and size. Okay, so my red is locked, but it seems like it's, 
So once it's in the editor, um, seems like it's still susceptible to being locked. Let me just see if. Yeah, so it looks like even when in the editor, like the the event can be kind of locked, uh, but once you're editing in the event, we'll just see if there's a lock in here. But it looks like it is kind of susceptible to being moved. So it looks like the event could be locked, but not necessarily the MIDI notes. So if you wanted to kind of edit against each other, you might just have to be um, cognizant of what you're editing. So let's say if you know if we have our multiple events selected. So, um, but I'll pass that along as a feature request. So it's a good point. Thanks for that. All right, wonderful to see Tim Weinheimer from Mission Viejo. All right, so we have a question from Jose. Just ask, uh, is there any way to make the project start before zero, like make it sound after a few seconds without having to move all the tracks? So if you go to the project setup window, so right now let's say all of my uh, pieces of music here come at you know, measure one, uh, but if you go to project to project setup, you'll see a display bar offset. So let's say I move that to two, um, you get prompted. Uh, we modified the bar events. Do you want to keep the events at the bar positions? We'll say yes. And now what we have is a negative one measure, a measure zero and a measure one. So try just going Again, you hit shift plus the letter S, like setup, and then just setting a display bar offset. So I think that will do the trick. All right, uh, so we see how can we make Indian classical beats uh, in Cubase? Um, so I'm probably not the I, the best person for this, but if I wanted to, um, I'll I'll give it an attempt here. So let's add uh, an instrument track. I think that there's some inside of Halion. Let's see if I had the library installed. All right, so let's say and excuse my ignorance of So and this isn't necessarily come with Cubase, but there are, you know, d d like within Halion 7. So, but let's say. Um, just, okay, so. So, but again, any, any sounds that you have, you could also just, uh, let's say if I wanted to do like in Halion Sonic 7, which now is free to download for all Cubase users. So you, everyone could download that free, but let me just uh, add a Halion Sonic 7 and let's see if it's one of the uh, included libraries. So we'll come here to Halion Sonic. 
and let's look for okay so I want you know percussion so I'm not sure if it's going to be um, maybe under ethnic and let's see if there's I realize that that's probably not, but you know, once you have a particular um, sound set that you could, you know, just program in directly within the drum editor and be able to kind of, you know, be able to just listen to. And, you know, as you kind of just program beats like you would for any sound source. So, uh, but you know, there are special tools inside of like Howlian 7 for, you know, world percussion stuff that you could use. Okay, uh, so we have a question. Um, is there any way to select two guitar tracks, for example, and edit them with warp, but when you put marker to only be on one track and not on both? Um, so let's say if we have uh, two guitar parts. We'll jump here, so I think. Okay, so let's say I have two guitar parts here. So if you wanted to warp these together, uh, all you have to do is let's go to like our free warp and then we could drop in our warp markers. So let's say we want warp markers here, here and there. So now when we want to do warping, we're able to warp both tracks together. And then if I just have one track selected and we go to the warp marker, I could then edit independently of each other. So let me know, you know, I'm just going to reread the question. Um, so we have two guitar selected, edit them with warp, but when you put marker to be only on one track, not on both. So, you know, if you want to edit both of them, you know, it's going to make sense to, you know, I'm not sure why you don't need the warp, you know, if you're going to edit both of the guitar parts, you know, you should, you know, it's going to be, the handle is going to be based on the warp. Um, but if you wanted to warp them independently is, you know, just, you know, depends on your selection. So, but let me know if there's like a particular workflow that, you know, you only want, you want to edit two guitar parts, but not warp one. So you can warp them independently, or if they're both selected, warp them together. So it's really kind of whatever is currently selected. So you can warp independently when one is selected or if they're both selected warp them together so but let me know if i'm misunderstanding all right so we have a question uh is there a way to make the sampler traps uh, have a static velocity even if triggering MIDI is different velocities. Okay, so let's say if I want to take 
this particular part will go, I think it's maybe to sampler track instead of traps. So if I hit my keyboard, very soft. Um, so I think if we go, that we there is a fixed velocity. So if we come here, let's fix pitch. So we see, I think there might be a fixed velocity setting. So say so we're playing it softly here. All right, so this will be fixed pitch, so whatever pitch you're playing it on will automatically So I don't see it, but you could always, you know, just if you wanted to, you know, just come directly to like the input transformer. Um, and there's probably just uh, say, OK, we want to go to our track and let's open the panel. And we could say, you know, velocity, we want to transform. And then we'll just say value two. equals, let's say 100. Let's try again. So let's see if we could do uh, type is equal to note and we want value two to be set to fixed value of 100. So no matter, matter how hard or soft I hit, it will automatically go. So it may not be part of the sampler track, but you can do it with the input transformer pretty easily. So let me know if that's helpful. See, Jose just says, uh, I love the live streams every week. I have more questions and they are all answered. Thanks, Greg. It seems like a pretty simple formula to me, you know, answer people's questions. Okay. But I'm not a clever marketing guy. All right, so uh, Balsa asks, uh, hi, Greg, what is the difference between disable and hide a plugin in the VST plugin manager? Uh, what should I do if I don't want some plugins to load when starting Cubase? So I think when you go to the VST plugin manager here, so it's, all right, and let's say, you know, if you don't want it to actually, uh, you know, show up at that point, you know, I think disabling it uh, is still visible but is not necessarily uh, going to, um, you know, so it's not going to be taking up any CPU or you know, any resources perhaps on the system. And then if you just simply hide the VST plugin manager, it just doesn't show up in the particular list. So if you want to maybe, you know, have access to a plugin that's already installed, um, you know, I would hide it, but if you know that I never want to use this plugin to cause problems, then I would just disable it. All right, so we have John Barry checking in from Old England. Thanks for joining us today. We have XQBase X on as well.
All right. Uh, so we see Greg, is it possible for you to show off VST live a bit? A competition is coming up in Sweden. Maybe uh, I need to perform live on stage with one song of mine. Um, I don't have the latest version. Uh, I've been kind of deep diving into uh, Howling in 7 this week, but I could have the latest version kind of installed and I could show it on Tuesday's live streams, Soren. So. Okay, so Patrick asks, uh, Greg, I know Cubase has Spectrum Analyzer, but does it have mid, side, and phase issues? Uh, how to spot problem if I have problems with mid, and side, and phase? Uh, can you kind of show us? Uh, I believe it has. So we could do this with um, the Supervision plugin. So come here. Let's take this particular track. Didn't like that. All right. So. Okay, so let me just so let's take a look at the metering for doing mid inside. And of course this would need to be on a stereo source. All right, so let's say So I'll go to my control room. So let's go ahead and look at, let's say, our frequency response or signal. So here we could look at just like the left channel, the right channel, or the mid, or we could look at the sides. So let's say we want to go to maybe our spectral domain and say, okay, I want a spectrum bar. So here we can see like if there's any like frequencies are kind of popping out in the mid part, middle part of the panning spectrum, or if we want to do it on the sides, or just the right channel, and we could look at the mid side combined. And if you want to do this for is there a spectrum curve, we could also just kind of see what's going on just in the mid or the side or the stereo bus or the mid and side combined. So you could just kind of look for you know, if there's particular frequencies that you notice are kind of maybe in the mid range that are kind of conflicting, you could use these to determine the particular frequencies that are, you know, causing problems in your mix and be able to isolate that and correct it with EQ. All right, so we see, uh, is there a way to solo defeat sampler tracks? Okay, so let's give it a shot. Okay, so now we're in the sampler track. Okay, let's come over to mix console. Yep, so all you have to do is as you know, when you click on solo, and this is for a sampler track, or let me just make sure it's for the sampler track. Okay, so we click on solo and then just hold down 
the left mouse button when you click on solo. And then you can see then it changes into a defeat. And now it's not going to be affected by soloing a particular channel. So just like any channel, you could just come here and just, so you click once and it will solo the sampler track. And then if you click and hold, and you'll see it turn kind of an orange color with the letter D, that means it's in solo defeat. So you can do it the same way for a sampler track or for an audio track, same, same process. All right, so we see uh, from XQBase X, uh, if I upgrade Absolute 5 to Absolute 6, I also get Halion 7, correct? So yes, you do. So Halion 7 is part of Absolute 6. So yeah, so you might as well just do that and you know, and that way all of your new programs are under the new licensing scheme in Absolute. Okay, so we see, sorry, my chat field just jumped on me. Let me get back to where it was. Okay, so we see from uh, Soren, uh, I play my drum kit and have MIDI to Cubase. I dissolve the part with pitch selection. If I move a MIDI fader, all volume is affected for all drums. I uh, need to control the volume on individual. Um, so realize that when you're doing this, if you have a MIDI track set up, so, you know, depending on your source. So, you know, MIDI volume in of itself. So let me, I'll just do a new project here quickly. Okay, so when we come to, let me just go to my VSTI rack. I'm just gonna add Groove Agent SE. Okay, so now when I have a pattern I'll just drag this over to the Groove Agent SE. So now we play this pattern back. All right, so realize that when we do this, that we have a, if it's a starting from a MIDI track, uh, you know, there's one, vol, you know, MIDI volume is going to be uh, for all notes within the MIDI channel. It's just part of the MIDI spec. So if you're starting from a MIDI track and then we do the dissolve part, realize that when we come over, so we'll go to MIDI to dissolve part and we're gonna separate pitches, that now all these are on their separate pitches and I adjust the volume of just one source and that's how MIDI volume works. So, you know, as we would just play one particular source, and I'll just loop this, that this is going to, you know, MIDI itself, when you do MIDI volume, that it's going to, you know, MIDI volume affects every note, it's channel wide. So, you know, at this point, that's why you may want to start with an instrument track. When you do an instrument track, it is going to populate new instruments for each of the different sources, and then you'll have independent control. But a lot of times you may end up better instead of using volume is just to take the velocity. So let's say, so let's say I want to come here to um, my snare track. You know, I could just select the velocity here and decrease the velocity. So let's say I want this to be 80. Or I 
So you may get the kind of the same effect just using velocity, but realize that, you know, when you take a MIDI track that's routed to drums and split it, if they're all in the same MIDI channel, that volume is global for, uh, for MIDI. So, you know, so the whole channel is going to go up or down. Um, so if you put them on different MIDI channels and load up different instruments, then you could have independent volume. But if you're playing from the same source, uh, at that point, you know, one, and it's just kind of a limitation of MIDI from 1982, you know, 40 years ago, that, you know, it's just part of the language. Uh, hello, Greg. Is there a way to record audio from YouTube with Cubase? Um, you know, there, there are utilities. I think uh, Voice Meter on Windows. There's uh, other utilities on Mac that will allow you to kind of get the audio in. Uh, what I've always found to be kind of a good source is there's a, a number of like YouTube to MP3 converters where you just type in the YouTube address and then it'll it'll just take the audio of the YouTube video as an MP3 file that you could put anywhere in your computer and open it up. And it's just really that when you're playing back the audio, you know, from the system, it's using a different driver architecture for the most part. And that's why it just doesn't, you know, so it's not necessarily a limitation of Cubase. It's just that the system drivers audio isn't really capable of being sent out anywhere other than speakers or headphones. So there's no real kind of internal communication route. So some people will, you know, play it out of their built-in audio interface and connect a cable to their audio interface that Cubase uses. That's common as well. But it's not necessarily a Cubase limitation. It's just that the, you know, what, what the uh, driver architecture doesn't really have to, it doesn't have the ability to kind of route audio internally. Okay. All right, so we have Stefan checking in from Sweden. We have Grant Slauson, just saying he really appreciates these sessions. Thank you. Okay, so we see from David Griffiths uh, about the Ranger track. Um, Says, sorry, I wasn't clear about the arranger track problem, Greg. Uh, when I change the color of the arranger track for color shades, it doesn't follow the color I've changed it to. Um, so let me just do a new project. I think we still have that as arranger. Okay, so these were preserved. Um, okay, so when I change the color of the arranger track, uh, the color shades don't follow the color I've changed it to. So let's say if we change this color. So I'm not sure if you're expecting like um, so let's say we make this blue, that if these are automatically colored, so maybe I, I don't think I'm still, I, it says, uh, when I change the color of the arranger track, the color shades don't follow the color I've changed it to. So, you know, maybe if we come here and just select the arranger event, so I think that there's. Let's see if we have both of them selected. Yeah, so you may have to colorize uh, the arranger track. You know, so if you want this to these i these colors to change based on this color, um, so it doesn't look like you could do both at the same time. But if you kind of just select all the events, it's easy enough just to kind of come over here and say, okay, I want those so let me know if that's what you wanted to do is to change the color here and have 
the color carry over for all of the other parts. So I see that it doesn't do that if that's what you want it to do, but you could again, just come over and change them to match. But let me know if I'm still misunderstanding. Okay, so we see, uh, Greg, uh, normal song themes, only having 40 to 50 tracks. Uh, we're having phasing issues, uh, but how come composers doing 1,000 tracks to 1,500 tracks do things without phasing problem? Uh, is there something I'm missing? So, you know, I'm not sure what is causing phasing issues. Um, you know, maybe, you know, figure out what the problem is. You know, like if you copied the same you know, instrument track and duplicated it, you know, like, you know, 20, 50 times. Um, I don't think that you would have phasing issues on it. So let's just give it a shot here quickly. So let's say, okay, I want to add... Okay, so let's come here. Push it here. All right, I'm gonna turn the volume down to kill. Sorry. So that's 64 tracks. Um, so it doesn't seem to be any phasing issues. So maybe it's like, yeah, plugins that aren't cooperating. Um, but th that all seems, I may have to allocate more memory for it, but that was 64 tracks without any phasing issues. So even if we wanted to Yeah, so I mean, so I don't think it's the number of tracks you have in Cubase. Maybe it's plugins you have or tracks that are slightly out of time that are causing the phasing issues. Um, but I have, you know, so I think that there's something that, you know, maybe some of the tracks are slightly out of time or maybe it's a plugin that's not compensating correctly that's it's reporting its latency erroneously. Um, but it doesn't seem like there's any phasing issues going on with 64 tracks all playing back to the same drum part. Okay, so we see a uh, question. Hey, I wasn't able to find information to transfer license with the new Steinberg licensing. Uh, how can we transfer the license with it? Um, so are you, I don't know if you're transferring like to another party, to like another person, or if you're transferring, uh, if you have licenses on different accounts, if you're transferring from like, if you have two different My Steinberg accounts, or if you're transferring from a license on a USB e licensor to a to the new Steinberg licensing, so maybe if you give some more information, I might be able to help.
Right. So David Griffiths asked, uh, also, did you say there was a grace period for Halion 7? I bought Absolute 5 in a promotion and I still have to pay to upgrade to Halion 7. Is that right? So I think if you bought it November 1st or after that you're automatically entitled to the grace period. So check your My Steinberg account. Um, so I think it's November 1st, which I think includes kind of when the promotion started. All right, so Craig asks, uh, can you share the process of group editing multi-track drums with phase coherency while using the quantize panel and converting hit points into warp markers? Been doing this by hand. So you may not have to do it by hand. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example here. So the phase coherency can be kind of done. Uh, you could add that if you're doing it manually, but uh, there's a lot of functions in Cubase you may not have to do it manually. like my 64 groove agents. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's open up this project. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I have all of my drum tracks in a folder here. So let's go ahead and just listen to my folder and we'll listen to our drums with a click. So I think we'll have like, so that fill is a little late. like that snare fill pushed. So what I want to do is I'm just going to uh, find kind of the hit points for my various, so let's say I wanted to find hit points for some of the main sources. So I'm going to come over here to edit hit points uh, and we'll make sure that we're not, you know, that we have our threshold set high enough so it's only really including kicks. So see, I think this will be our tom fill. Okay, and I want to do the same for my snare. So let's double click here on our snare drum. So I don't want the toms or the hi-hat, which is physically close and often bleeds into snare mics. Okay, so that threshold looks pretty good. And in this case, we have like the hi-hat kind of setting rhythmic characteristics at the beginning. So we just go, let's set our threshold here. Okay, so now that I've found those particular thresholds, I'm gonna just place this into group editing. And let's open up the quantize panel. Uh, and then we're gonna set our priorities. So I'll say, okay, let's do kick at five. Uh, we'll do our snare at four. And let's do our hi-hat. We'll give that a priority of three. Okay, so now we have group editing on and it's basically created slices based upon these criteria. So where it's created the markers across all the tracks. And why we group it together is because like when a snare hits, um, we're gonna see the snare hit, you know, in other tracks as well. So this snare hit, we could see it in the toms, we could see it in the hi-hat mic. So, you know, so if we move just the snares over, you know, it's gonna sound out of time because the other snares aren't really happening at the same moment. So at that point, you know, we wanna slice all of our different tracks. So we click on slice, all right. So it's now sliced all of our audio. At this point, I'm gonna say, let's quantize it to 16th notes. So we'll say quantize, okay? And as it's quantized, we'll see that there will often be gaps in the audio. So at this point, what we want to do is to crossfade all of those gaps. And as we play it back, and 
around like where we had like our snare roll that was fast. So that's how we could do it with that. Now, if we wanted to edit those particular hit points, you know, if we wanted to now take a different approach where, okay, we only wanted to do, you know, perhaps, you know, across multiple sources, we could enable our warping. So let's say I want to take like, you know, we could take the hit points and convert that into warp markers. So if we go to audio to real time processing, we'll say create warp markers from hit points. Okay. Uh, but, or if we wanted to just manually do this, let's come over here to our warp and say, okay, let's go into free warp and let's say, okay, like this hit, we could now just kind of place warp markers manually, or you could do it from hit points. And we say this hit was all, you know, out of time. And this is where we could, you know, enable the phase coherency as we warp multiple tracks. So if you have like a drum track that's just really sloppy, maybe quantize it. If it's just like, oh, this one hit, you know, the bass player came in early and that sounds good and I want the drums to match up, I could just kind of take that one hit and just move it over manually. So we could think of like the multi-track free warping with the phase coherency is like one or two little touch-ups, but if the performance is really bad overall, you know, just quantize the whole thing. So let me know if that's helpful. All right, so we see a uh, question. Uh, I was told that there is a new version of Howlian Sonic SE. Is that true? So now it's just called Howlian Sonic. Uh, so if you just go to Steinberg website, download Howlian Sonic. Uh, you know, it's Howlian Sonic 7. That's a new player. All of your presets, all your programs that were in Howlian Sonic SE 3 automatically load up into Howlian Sonic uh, because that's the right thing to do. Um, so there's no problems with projects opening up. It was like, oh, this was in Howling and Sonic SE. Uh, it's all just, just you know, translates over. So yeah, download that. And that was released yesterday when the, you know, when the actual Howling and Seven and Absolute Six were released. And so it's a nice freebie. Okay, so we have AJ Soundbites saying hello to everyone. All right, we have Mark Winslow wishing everyone aloha from Hawaii. I'm looking forward to going to Hawaii on my vacation in about six weeks. All right, so we see... Uh, how can you copy question from Wilson Ruiz? Uh, how can you copy and paste in a channel above and another channel below. Let's give it a shot. Okay, so I'm just going to Okay, so let's say I'm going to delete these two. So let's say I copy this. So I'm just gonna hit Control or Command plus the letter C. Let's select this track and hit Control or Command in this track. Let's see if it pastes to both. So it looks like I only paste to one at a time. So if I select this, um, so you could probably make a macro of it if you needed to. So let's say I have this copied. All 
All right, so let's say I copy and I want to paste it here. Um, just get a key command. Okay, so let's say I want to come over, let's go up. We'll select that and let's add it. Let's navigate down. All right, now here we just want to So we're going to paste. And then let's navigate down. Let me remove this. Wrong one. Okay, so let's see if this will work. All right, so I'm gonna copy this and then run the macro. So yeah, I think you can make a macro to do it. Um, but it looks like it's just paste it one source together. And let me just see if I can. Yeah, so you might have to do it independently, but I could work on a macro if you want. Um, see if I can get it sorted out. If you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de. All right. All right, so we have a question. Uh, hi, Greg, I have MIDI drums, which have some high velocity, which is reason for peaking. So how to select notes which have high velocity with uh, MIDI logical editor inside key editor? Okay, so let's say I had these notes and we'll look at our velocity. All right, and let's say I just wanted to take uh, particular notes here. So we could say, let's go to our MIDI logical editor. Let's get a setup. So we could choose to select. Let's, we'll start by selecting notes. So we'll say uh, type is select, type is equal to note. Uh, and let's choose value two, which is velocity, uh, is inside the range of one. 20 to 127. So now I can hit apply and that will select all notes there. We could also say uh, that are bigger than 120. So if I wanted to come here, let's select all notes that have a velocity greater than 120. Uh, now, if we wanted to transform that, we could say, let's 
come over here and say we want to take value two and we want to multiply by 0.9. So we can take everything that has a velocity of 120 or higher and and knock it down 10%. So we could do stuff like that as well if you want to do correction or if you didn't want it to be, you could say 0.95. And you could also divide by 1.05, kind of same thing. So let's say in this scenario, so now every note that has a higher velocity than 120, let's uh, knock it down by 5%. So you could do stuff like that as well. So whether it's a drum part or MIDI part, same. Okay, so we see this is uh, directed to Jazz Dude, um, and he just says uh, about Howling and Seven. Says, dude, the big advantage of Howling Seven is to make your own instruments. But other than that, is there anything else uh, that's way better than SE? So you get a lot more content with it. So with the like, Howling Sonic SE, you don't get FM Lab, you don't get Tails. You you know, there's a lot of additional content with it. Plus, you could do you know 64. Uh, MIDI channels within one particular instance um, and a lot more depth of editing still, you know, because you could tweak your own instruments and create your own instruments. Uh, but, you know, the content that comes with it, uh, especially FM Lab, is a pretty phenomenal instrument. So you do get more, a lot significantly more content. And as Jazz Dude points out, you could even load up SysX files from DX7 and TX81Zs. Um, so we see, uh, hi Greg, is a spin FX plugin from Cubasis available for Cubase? It's awesome. So I don't think that, is that a, um, I'm not sure if that, if, if that's a, is that a Steinberg plugin or is that like maybe a third party plugin? Um, I haven't used it in Cubasis, but I know that, you know, pretty much all of the included plugins have their own VST counterparts that would be loaded in Cubase, and that's how they ensure kind of project compatibility between the two. Um, but I don't know if it's spin plugin, but I'm not sure maybe if it's just rotary, if it's kind of like a like a Leslie cabinet type of plugin. But I'll take a look at it um, if and right after the live stream. Okay, so we see from uh, Randy, he says, uh, when working in a key editor, I'm pressing a note on my MIDI keyboard. The key I'm pressing is highlighted in a key editor. Is this possible in a drum editor? Uh, key is highlighted when, when pressing. So let's take a look. Okay, so. It doesn't look like it's highlighted. It was... Let me just see if there's... Um... Yeah, so I know that when we go to like our MIDI editor, as you mentioned, that you could see the keys being hit, but I don't see a way of doing it in the drum editor. Just make sure I'm not missing one little icon.
Yeah, we can see the velocity, but not the actual pitch. So, um, but that would kind of make sense. Let me make sure I'm not missing. So it looks like it doesn't indicate the actual pitch that you're playing, but I can see where, um, but I'll, I'll make sure to kind of pass that along. Let me just. Yeah, so uh, sorry about that, but I'll, I'll include it in my notes. All right, so we see you got your just saying, uh, I was not sure he's missing with Howling in seven. Um, so if it played contact libraries, I would get it. So obviously, uh, it does have contact libraries, but you know, most contact libraries are going to be kind of copy protected, and we respect that from other, you know, from other companies for their intellectual property rights. Um, but I think, you know, once you play around with it, um, yeah, check out some of the videos that Dom Sagalas did as well. And think of it not as just as a sampler, but you know, it's gonna be virtual analog, wavetable, granular, tone wheel, FM, synthesis, and sampling. You can combine all those different uh, different aspects. So instead of having multiple programs to do that. All right, wonderful to see Daniela Tokan on. All right, and we see a question from uh, Lauren. Hi, Greg, I want to route Media Bay preview to other output than the main mix uh, to insert effects. So all you have to do, you know, if you wanted to route the Media Bay for um, just uh, to preview is just, you know, go to your audio connection. So you could have one output here for you know going to your speakers and if you wanted a different output for previewing you could also you know when you go to your control room is just to have uh have these routed to different outputs one other thing that you could do if you're if you're previewing like a lot of people will preview with headphones and is just to when you go here is to set up a phones channel and have that routed to other outputs and if you go to the preferences and go to control room, you could use the phone channels as the preview channel. So um, so if you wanted to just you know even have the headphones connected and route the headphones to a different source, you don't have to necessarily listen to it with headphones. At that point, you could just uh, preview automatically through the headphones channel if you wanted to. So you could do it. Thanks for joining. So we see from Danielle uh, says, uh, I see you can run Howling in 7 outside of Cubase. So yeah, it works as standalone, AAX, uh, and AU plugins, as well as VST3. All right, so we see from uh, Jeff Sabelski, uh, I've been playing so much oboe, making reads. Uh, I don't even know if my Cubase 12 Pro has Halion 7. Wait, does my Absolute 5 have Halion 7, or is it still 6? So uh, what it is is Absolute 5 was updated to include Halion 7, and that's Absolute 6. So you could upgrade your Absolute. And I think the only difference between Absolute 5 and 6 you know, features wise, other than licensing is seven. So people are like, oh, why is the cost for absolute five to six the same price as Howling in six to seven update? You know, it's because it's, you know, you're paying for the same thing for them. So, so you could definitely upgrade Jeff.
All right, so we see uh, from Sven Isaacson, uh says, great, uh, Halion 7 and Sonic standalones. Mac OS work with Moto, I guess, Moto audio interfaces. Let's hope Steinberg sees it to fix the issues for Groove Agent and the Grand as well. So make sure that, you know, um, so I I haven't, run, I don't have any Moto hardware, but I've run it with multiple audio interfaces in standalone mode. I haven't had any problems, but I'm, but I could look into it if you want to email me. All right, so we have Anders McCormick on. All right, and we have David Ruder checking in from, and Kristen Parisi from Big Tent Productions in Nashville. Thanks for joining us. Always wonderful to see you both on. All right, so we see from, um, okay, so you see that's kind of, all right, we see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas is on. So thanks for joining us today. We see Jeff Zabelski at 133 was like number 47. So I still have lots of questions to catch up on. All right, we have Jeweler DeRocket on and Bruce, Bruce Bruton. Checking in from Simi Valley, and we have Trond from Norway. See, Little Wing Audio says he backed it up to the like and nearly tripped over his laptop. All right, wonderful to see Steve Leeds on. All right, so we have uh, Jeweler to Rocket asks uh, how to set up a default color to the tracks when exporting them into a new project. Okay, so let me just, so I think if you just go to preferences uh, and go to, let's say you go to, um, I think it's under track and mix console channel colors. So if you want them all to go to the default color, you could do that, or you could do the previous color, um, last applied color, and, or use random track colors. So if you set this to the, you know, tracks will use the default color. Um, as you export it, it will all go to your very first color that you have in your color palette. So once again, go to preferences under user interface, track and mix console channel colors, and then you could just choose to use the tracks default color. And that is the first color that you see in the color palette here. So if we change that, I usually have it, you know, use previous color plus one so that the colors are kind of automatically uh, implemented and different throughout the project. All right, so we see uh, Anders McCormick asks, uh, hey, Greg, I was wondering what the best method is for variable tempo. Say if I record some strings, it starts slow and get quicker. Is there a way to sync the metronome to that recording uh, so it's easier to record other players on top of it or program percussion that could be drawn in easily on the grid? Thanks. Yes, yeah, so there's a couple ways to do it. One is you could you know, figure out what the tempo is of the original and then create a click track based on that. And once you figure out what the tempo is on the original track, you could also, you know, if it's fluctuating too much and if you wanted it tighter, you could change that as well. So we'll show you both ways. And this process will work for multiple tracks or a single track, like I'll show you here. Okay, so let's say we were going to listen to this without um, 
with the click on and we see that there's no correlation between the two so I could take this recording and let's go to our project menu and we'll go to tempo detection analyze So now we figured out what the tempo is of the original recording and it's fluctuating. So now if I wanted this tempo here and let's say I'm just gonna find like the downbeat, which is right here. So it figures out the beat. So uh, as we work on this, we'll see that, okay, I want this to be my downbeat. So now we could have a click track that's following your string performance. Now, if I have multiple tracks or a single track, we could get an audio to advanced and let's set definition from tempo. So this is basically going to embed all of the tempo changes into the file. So now I will have it play back a steady tempo. Let's say it was roughly like 144. Where I want it to be 156. Now it's playing perfectly steady. One thirty-two. Again, that function to take an existing recording and have it then be able to follow tempo changes accurately is audio to advanced to set definition from tempo. And that basically embeds all of the metadata for the beats for each of the files directly into the file itself. And then it will respond to whatever tempo changes you have. So you could do it either way. All right, wonderful to see Nick on the live stream. I bet he's enjoying that he won a contest for and picked absolute five uh, towards the end of our, for our Christmas. All right, so we see uh, from a question from Jeweler to Rocket, uh, in the metering settings to hold the peak, why we can't go lower than 500 milliseconds? Uh, is there a coming feature that allows us to see the RMS signal with the peak signal in the mixer fader signal? So I think um, we could do that in like kind of the dedicated meters, but we go to, let's say our mix console, and we're looking at our meters here. Let's get to the meter settings. So let me just see if it's going to be in the preferences here. Okay, so let me just, just stop that real quick. So I think that, you know, that's a pretty standard setting for, um, you know, for metering times. So, um, you know, because I, I think, you know, if you're doing less than that, you don't really get a sense of that. But if, you know, I'll pass it along for, I know I've passed along in the past about being able to see kind of peak and RMS in that meter as opposed to really kind of seeing it only like within, you know, some of the global meters here, but I'll pass that along again. But I think 500 milliseconds is pretty sensible uh, release time. All right, so we see, uh, does anyone know if a MIDI controller can be connected to tempo record right now? It appears I can only <clears throat> use the mouse, which hurts my soul. So if you want it to like tap along, so let's revert to this. Let's 
So I'm just going to create a MIDI track here, right? And, and I'm just going to play a MIDI note and kind of tap along with the performance. So, so I'll just hit record. I'll just zoom out so you can see a little better. All right, so if I wanted to make a tempo map based on what I played in from the MIDI controller, we would just go to MIDI, and let's say if we go to functions, merge tempo from tapping, and we can say I tapped a quarter note, or I tapped at you know a beginning, uh, you know, or I tapped a whole note or eighth note, and now we could just come here. It says a, uh, and then you could actually just create kind of a tempo map based on that. So if you wanted to tap tempo from MIDI, just go to, um, you know, record a MIDI track. And at that point, merge tempo from tapping. So, so let me know if that helps your soul. So it's not bothered as much. All right, uh, so we see Doug O just asks, uh, hi Greg, just bought a dual monitor. Uh, is there any settings you'd recommend Cubase Pro 12 to use with a dual monitor setup for workflow hacks? You know, there's really not much to do. You know, um, I have dual monitors on my system and I also have kind of one 27 inch and I kind of, you know, have multiple computers feeding my kind of large 27 inch. Uh, and But, you know, for years I ran two like 22 inch monitors um but it's really there's nothing really specific in cubase you know realize that you know some windows can be dragged over so like if you want to do some elements you may have to extend the window over a common scenario is like you know i want my full screen mixer on the second screen and just drag it over and then you can maximize it uh to just fit on that screen but there's nothing really special in cubase you have to do um, and it's also just great. I have a friend in Nashville. I think he has like nine different display monitors going. So it's, it's cool. So enjoy your two screen setup. It's hard to go back. And so you got yours just mentioning workspaces are also good with dual screen. All right. So Nick is saying that the like button loves the attention. So. All right. Um, so we see a question from Ace Amadeus. Great to see you on the live stream. Um, can I draw in a pencil tool notes for a violin solo that I want to assign Mixolydian scale to them and have Cubase discard notes that are not in that scale? Thanks. So yeah, let's go ahead and take a look. So add an instrument track quickly here. All right, so I'm just gonna randomly draw notes in here. Okay, so when we go to our scale assistant, we could say, okay, I wanna use the editor scale. So let's say, okay, I want it to be D, uh, you know, mixolydian, you know, so we could just, Come over here. So I want to be D mixolydian, and then we could say uh, quantize pitches. And at that point, let's come over here. I'll just select all, and now we could quantize pitches, and that will move all the pitches directly over 
to demix a Lydian if you want it to be. Um, you know, a blue scale pentatonic melodic minor. I could just come over here. And so once you have your scale set at this point, you can say, okay, I want it to be Locrian. At that point, you could just quantize the pitches and that will move it directly to the particular scale that you've defined, Ace. See, Anders, as you see his comments, says, the amount of times I've moved tracks to give space at the beginning, it's like, that's handy. So, yep, this is, you learn all sorts of great tips and tricks in live streams like that. So you can learn from other people's questions. So it's kind of the great thing about this format. See, Nick is asking Jeff Sabelski if he makes make sure the drivers for his oboe reads are up to date. Yeah. New operating systems always coming. All right, uh, so we see a question from Command Beat. Um, why does my exported track sound terrible, not in Cubase, but after exporting? Um, so a lot of times it could be, you know, you know, try when you do your export audio mix down, you know, if you're going straight to like MP3, make sure you're doing like the same resolution wave file, you know, at the same sample rate and, at, you know, make sure that you're doing it to 8-bit or, you know, to like 24-bit or 32-bit uh, floating point so that you're not just throwing away data. If you have like your master fader in your console down, you know, realize that that's going to drop a lot of signal. Um, so, you know, make sure that you have your master fader up and adjust the tracks within the gain structure. So sometimes people will compensate and have like powered speakers that they turn up and they have their master volume kind of down a bit overall. And if that's the case, you're telling Cubase to throw away 20 dB of gain. And that's why it could change the sound there. So those are common things that people um, that can fix situations when people often ask me that. So let me know. All right, so we see um, edit active part doesn't actually edit the active part only, please address. Okay, so let me just go to a different project here. Okay, so let's say we have a base part. And a piano part here. All right, and I want to switch this to be part based. Okay, so right now, like when I go to edit velocities, we have uh, the base part here. So let me just check. Okay, so now I have this set. Okay, so let's say we have, um, okay, let me just come over here. So notice that I, so we have, let me just glue some of these parts together just to make it a little easier. Okay, so now when we go to edit, I'm just editing the actual bass part, but I'm not changing like velocities 
on the piano part. Now, if I select a note on a piano part, now it's the active part. So I'm not, you know, moving notes. So I would have to select an event there to make it the active part. Now I click on the piano note, that's the active part. And we could do the editing here. I could do the editing here. But if you select, you know, so if I want to take all these events and move them around, you know, we could come over and, you know, move events. And it's, you know, until you, you know, you make the other part active when you select an event. But, you know, it is only editing the active part. So if I wanted to come over here, select all, you know, we could only move, you know, whatever parts are actively selected. So make sure that, you know, you're only doing, you know, that you're selecting the event that you want to be editing. Uh, and then like that's what's edited. If you select another note, then that can turn into the active part just by what is selected. All right, wonderful to see Graham Witcher on the live stream. Thanks for joining us today, Royal Wooten Bassett in the UK. Okay, so I have a question from Best Korean Jesus. Uh, is there a way to select the entire range in FX modulator to randomize? Mine always leaves one segment unselected. So let's take a look. Oh, sorry, wrong category. Okay, so let me just. Okay, so it's. All right, so it looks like maybe the very first node is the same, but it's just kind of the starting off, well, not always, but often the first node, some of them. This is one segment is unselected. I wanna see if it's the same. So let me know if that's kind of the same for you, but let's say if we select all curve points so maybe like the very first one, let me see if I move that. So it looks like the very first node may stay consistent for the random. So I'll pass that along. Uh, but let me know if that's what you're seeing as well, best screen Jesus. All right, so we have Lord Schrader checking in from Essen, Germany. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so we see, I think this is with a guitar. Um, so, yeah, uh, so you want to see the hit point, but um, you want to, you want them both selected, but says, yeah, my point was to see the hit point. I want to see them both selected, but warp only on one of them. So let's take, jump back to that.
Okay, I'll just make this larger. So you can still see the hit points underlying. So um, I want to see them both selected, but warp only one of them. All right, so we see the hit points underneath here and let's switch to our free warp tool. So, you know, if they're both selected, they're both going to warp, but you could, you know, I'm not, you know, maybe if there's a particular reason. So you can see the hit points without it being selected. So now when you come over here, I can still see, like, if I wanted this hit point to line up to that particular marker, we could, you know, we could see the hit points directly in there. So it seems sensible to me, but you know, let me know if that doesn't make any sense to you. And I think if we select both of them in the sample editor, that we could pick and choose to show. Um, I'll change the color on this one so it'll be a little more obvious. So while doing well, in the sample editor, so let's say we want to do free warp. You know, so if I wanted this, so we could see kind of the underlying part behind it, if you wanted to. So let's say I only want to warp this particular one and then if you wanted to switch, you know, so you could see kind of both of them within the particular sample editor, if you wanted that to warp visually. So you can see the hit point underneath here and this warp point. So you could do stuff like that and be able to move different hit points around. All right, wonderful to see Michael Pierce on the live stream. Thanks for joining us. <clears throat> All right, so we see um, I use four synths at the same time using a controller keyboard. I use mute and solo to switch between the instruments. When I use R and W, when I play back, it does not play back exactly. So I, I don't think solos are automated, um, but you know, so if you're, if you had like four different MIDI events that were playing, I'll just duplicate this. You know, one easy way to kind of You know, instead of automating it, you know, you might also want to just say, okay, I want to take these events and okay, I want a, a change here, 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 and here, and just say, okay, when this comes in, I don't want these to start. Uh, I don't want these here. And, you know, you could just mute the events as well instead of automating it. So you can mute, you can automate the mutes, but I don't think the solos are automatable and it's kind of standard studio workflows for that. All right, so we see Ace is wishing everyone well. Hope, all right. All right, so we see, uh, can a MIDI controller be connected to the tempo record function rather than using the mouse? So if it's gonna be um, for like within the tempo editor for this, um, you have to use the mouse for this, but you can use, you know, once you're doing this, you could use the mouse scroll wheel 
so you kind of just write in your tempos but it doesn't work with a like an ai knob but the mouse scroll wheel will work right here just to write in different tempos so i think scroll wheel scroll wheel works pretty well so Okay, um, all right, so we see a question from Ace Amadeus. Uh, I tried to highlight a group of MIDI tracks. I wanted to raise the scale up by five. It would only do one track at a time. Is there a way to use the editor to multiple tracks at the same time? So I think we could just do it on a project window. So let's see if my edits are here. So let's say I wanna take all of these tracks and So I would select the events on the project window, and then if you go to MIDI, there's a transpose setup. Um, so here you could just say, okay, I wanna move it up nine. You know, So you could just go to MIDI, and you could see that that is automatically, you know, so say we have all the events selected, and we go to the transpose setup. So we could say, okay, let's you know, adjust, and you can see all of them will just shift as you do that. So, you know, maybe not within the editor because you may have the edit active part only, but you could just select the media events on the project window and do the transpose there. So let me know if that makes sense, Ace. Uh, so we see, Greg, are you planning a Halion 7 series? Also some Halion Civic specific streams for Q&A. Um, I may be doing it. I mean, I'll, I'll see if I can fit, fit it in. Um, but, you know, I'm currently, you know, doing, you know, like two days of live streams. And while it's a four-hour live stream, I have to do like, you know, often two hours in advance of to answer questions that have come in and do prep stuff and four hours afterwards of doing the indexing and all the reporting and all that stuff. So, um, I will see if I could schedule it in, but my count, you know, my work schedule, you know, and I do that in addition to like a full-time job for other tasks and creating tutorials that are being released every week. Um, so we'll try, I'll try to see if I could fit it in, uh, so, but it's currently, you know, my schedule is pretty swamped as it is just kind of with current live streams, but we'll see if we can get it in. Uh, maybe we could talk Dom Sigalis into doing a live stream on it. But as always, if you have questions, you could just send it in advance and we're happy to answer any Halion 7 questions. All right, so we see a uh, question from Jeweler to Rocket. Uh, question, what is the peak in audio performance? Uh, it's jumping all the time, even if the project has zero plugins in it. I uh, just have a rough mix going on. The computer is powerful and buffer size is at 128. Thanks. Um, so make sure one, you know, see if it, you know, when you see like a little spike like that, it could be, it could indicate that there is something that's interrupting the real time audio performance, maybe a video card or a network card, something like that. Um, you could also try to raise the buffer and still see if you see the peak. You know, but kind of what you're describing where all of a sudden it seems like everything is running fine and you see a little spike periodically, you know, that's often something that's interrupting the real time audio performance on your system. And if you're on Windows, you can check out like the tool, uh, you know, we've often referred to it by resplendence uh, called latency mon, M-O-N. So, and that's a tool that can help you diagnose uh, like problematic uh, components on your system that could be causing that. 
And also make sure that you're using the Steinberg power scheme as you got yours, just mentioning that. So you get a studio set up, the audio system that you don't see it on the Mac platform, but you'll see, you know, use Steinberg power scheme as well. All right, so we see from uh, Little Wing Audio, I have the Zoom H2N Handy Recorder. Where do I install the drivers for HF Series Stereo ASIO Driver, HFS, uh, HF Series Multi-Track ASIO Driver, MS Decoder, VST Plugin, Windows 64-bit? So if you, you know, if the drivers are installed, I would assume that you would get them off the Zoom website. Uh, but to, you know, have Cubase talk to that and communicate all, and pass you know, and to communicate audio back and forth as you go to your studio menu to studio setup. And at this point, just see, select your Zoom as your uh, audio interface. You just click here under the ASIO driver. Um, so that's where you'd see it. And then you will see your VST plugins. Um, you know, if it's a VST3 plugin, it's automatically going to go into a path that Cubase will recognize if it's a VST to plug in, you go to um, like your VST plugin manager and you can go to this setup here. And at this point, you could choose to have the setup um, show like VST2 plugin paths if needed. So, but yeah, most of it's just going to be downloaded from the, from the Zoom website. All right, so reading through comments. Thanks for all the great questions from everyone. And if you've learned a new tip or trick, make sure you do hit the like button. All right. All right, so we, uh, we just see a question. Uh, can you please show how to write definition to audio files with embedded tempo changes to an audio file? And then how to export that file so that the changes are readable in another DAW. So with any audio file, all you'd have to do in Cubase is once we do uh, these, we have our tempo changes here. So let's say we have our tempo. We could go to your audio to advanced and set definition from tempo. Uh, so we could at this point choose write definition to audio files. Uh, once that is done, um, that is that that metadata is in the audio file. Now I don't I don't run a lot of other DAWs, but I would be inclined to say that other DAWs wouldn't be able to read that information. Uh, and it's not that it's not there. Um, just most DAWs, I think, and I could be wrong on this because again, I'm ignorant of workflows with other DAWs. Um, but I think most of them would only read a static tempo value as opposed to tempo values that do change and evolve over time. So, so Cubase can embed it in and if the R programs can read it, great. But I'm not, I don't know if they actually do. All right, so we have Gerald Ely checking in from Martinez, California. And we see Gareth is on from Spain, from Bilbao, Spain, I believe. All right, so we see uh, Luis uh, asks, hi, Greg, I'm here from the Tuesday live stream. Did you have time to check out the MIDI velocity triggering third-party plugin parameters? 
Uh, many thanks in advance. So yeah, I was playing around with it. It's not maybe the most elegant uh, solution, but I think it will kind of do the trick. So let's take a look at it. All right, so you'll probably need a MIDI loopback device. If you're on Mac, it's already available as part of IAC. Um, and then, um, you know, I, and there's like a loopback.be or loopback.de is a MIDI utility. So let's say I have um, a just a quick Groove Agent track here. Okay, and I have a um, just a quick MIDI file. Let me just look at. Okay, so let's say we have uh, our Groove Agent pattern here, and let's say I'm going to take just MIDI notes here. Let me just switch the editor, draw it in. All right, so let's say I wanted to, we'll look at the velocity of our MIDI drum editor. Let's say we wanted to go up and then to go down. Okay, so let's say I want to take this velocity pattern. All right, and we'll just kind of ignore the, so I'm going to take this velocity pattern here, and then I created a logical editor preset. So again, what we want to do is to use the velocity as the basis for, you know, changing parameters. So we see our velocity goes up and down, up and down. So at this point, what we're going to do is go to the MIDI logical editor. And I'm gonna convert the velocity into a MIDI CC. So we'll come over here, let's go to our setup. Um, and I think I just made, um, so I just switched it to MIDI velocity to CC12. So I'm gonna take, uh, and I'm gonna to choose to extract to a track. And then I'm gonna say type is equal to note, type, set to fixed value of controller and then we want to and this is under the event transform and we're going to say value one is we're going to set it to cc12 it could go to any cc number i just chose 12. so when i do this and i'm going to hit apply it now creates a new midi track here so in this midi track when you go to look at the data so is just going to contain CC12, and it's based upon the velocity values that we just triggered. Okay, so I want to send this track to my loopback driver. So we're going to say IAC bus on Mac, and that's a free part of the operating system. We're going to go to our generic remote. We may have to click on the plus sign. And here we want to set the IAC driver um, as the input and output. And we're going to say we're going to have controller 12. And then we're going to have this go to VST mixer. And I just had this go to the selected channel to control the sends. I could choose inserts, you know, whatever third party plugins, whatever's on that particular track, you could have it automatically assigned. Okay, so now I'm gonna select my Groove Agent track and let's go into the audio. And now as we would play this back, we should see the, the MIDI velocity of that particular part is adjusting the actual send. I know this is a little convoluted, but it does work. So again, what we need to do is extract the MIDI velocity, convert that into MIDI CC, it could be any CC, send this out of the loopback, go to 
the uh, studio setup. We'll add a generic remote. We're going to take CC1 and make sure that the MIDI channel is right. And we'll say the CC is 12. We want to go to fader one. We'll say VST mixer to selected. And then it could be an insert, could be a send, could be any parameter that you want within a particular plugin. So now that CC is being is driving the send on the selected channel so that as we look at it and hit play that that will kind of just automatically adjust the values like we just saw so we want this to again go out of the IAC and feed the generic remote and then once you have that generic remote working, then you could use that velocity value to drive different parameters and have it be in sync for you. So I know it's more convoluted than probably the other workflow, but if you save that as a kind of a generic uh, place setting, you know, as you know, you, we could just have that particular, you know, run the logical editor preset, have that set to an IEC, and if you do have it set for the same thing, just go in and change the parameter, and then that will be modulating the particular uh, parameter and its third party, you know, included plugins, it doesn't matter. That will modulate the parameter based on velocity. So. All right, so we see uh, um, that about the licensing question from earlier. It says, uh, there's no history of the previous system. Uh, now I want to sell my license to someone else. So I think if you just look on this Steinberg, uh, if you go to the, um, I'm not sure what the, uh, let's see if it's actually listed. Um, Let's see if it's listed here on the resale wizard. So I would check. Um, so there's a resale wizard. Um, okay. So you could just come over here to the Steinberg licensing. And then you, this will kind of walk you through kind of the whole process. So go to help center at steinberg.de and there's a resale wizard that should probably answer all the questions that you have on that. Gareth asks, uh, what prices have I missed tonight? So all sorts of wonderful free knowledge. So. It's, it's priceless. All right, so we see uh, this is Manuel for Angola. I'm facing an issue with license. I followed all the instructions as per Steinberger, but it's not working. Can you help? Cubase 12 Pro. Um, so I, if you could tell me like what part isn't working, um, that would be helpful. Uh, so... All right, so we see Anders. Uh, does someone listen to this and document all the questions for archive, or is it Greg doing it live as well as answering? Um, so I watch it after the live stream. I usually take a dinner break, um, and then within like an hour, hour and a half, I rewatch the whole live stream and type up all the questions. So it's archived and pinned to the top of each live stream. It's also going to be... Um, you could find all of the questions on cubaseindex.com. So that's also available there. All 
All right, so we see just at Steinberg website doesn't seem to have any information about selling the new license systems. It looks like there was on the resale wizard. All right, so we see, um, so we just see a question. Uh, hi, how do I change tempo without changing how long the audio loop is? Okay, so let's say, let's do a new project here. So I'm not sure if you wanted to change the length of it, but let's come over here. All right, so let's say we import a drum loop. All right, um, so as we have an audio loop in, a lot of times like if you, when you drop loops in, they may automatically follow the project tempo because they're set to musical mode. So let's say I have a different loop. I just randomly picked one at the same tempo I'm in. So let's say we listen to this um, and like when we like double click, we can see that these loops will play, will automatically enable musical mode. And once musical mode is turned on, at that point, the loop will play in time with the project. So if I play. All right, so let me just, but if I take it out of, and we turn on our metronome, but if I take it out of musical mode, it's not playing in time. So if you want the loop, uh, I'll just make sure. Um, so if you want to change the tempo without changing how long the audio loop is. So, you know, if you want it to play back in the same exact, in its original time, you could just, Come right here, and as you change the tempo, it doesn't change how fast the loop is playing back. We may see, see it visually change because the time is changing as we alter the tempo, but the loop is playing back. Now, once it's in musical mode, I change the tempo. It's going to stay on the same grid positions because it's automatically following and locked to the project tempo. So if you don't want it locked to the tempo and we need change for it to play back the same length, then take it out of musical mode. If, if it's a visual thing, you know, and you know, as you change the tempo and visually it's changing and you want it to stay the same, put it in musical mode. So I think you just probably need to toggle musical mode for the selected loop. All right, so we see Spike Williams is able to join us after after having a bad commute time. Uh, so we see a demo of Halion 7 would be great. Sir Gregor, did I miss it? So, you know, some of the new things, just kind of like overarching things, there's like probably 2,000 little things uh, that have been implemented. Um, so just to take a quick look at it, uh, let's say if we come over here to, you know, our VST instruments, let me just go media to VST instruments. So one, it's on the new Steinberg licensing. And with that, a lot of other instruments and sound sets have migrated over. So all the absolute five, you know, Callion was the big one, but you actually start off with, okay, I just want to... Uh, start with an analog synth, a wavetable synth, spectral FM synth, uh, sample instrument, a granular synth, grain synth, organ instrument. Or I wanted to do a single instrument, multi-instrument, you know, default screen set or advanced. So I could say, you know, one of the new things we're going to have, you know, the biggest, if you had to say one thing, is going to be, okay, I now have 
uh, an FM synth, you know, engine that's built in and is done in conjunction with Yamaha, who obviously has a long, long heritage with that. Uh, but if we wanted to go to different instruments that are included, we could say, okay, let's go to a single instrument. Uh, there's a brand new media bay that's also been updated. So if you now wanted to come over here, uh, you could say, okay, I'm just looking for synth leads that are, you know, analog and that are modern. And then we could find all the different instruments. Or if you just say, okay, I wanted to get rid of all of my search criteria. I wanted to jump here. Let's go through FM lab. So, and this is kind of probably the most comprehensive FM synth that's, in, that's kind of has ever been conceived of. So now as we kind of play, we could just say, okay, within FM lab, I just wanted like different synth pads. So we could come here. So if you wanted to come over here within FM lab and say, okay, let's look at my different oscillators and I wanted to see my eight operators and my carriers and be able to, you know, say I want two carriers and three, three operators and be able to adjust all these different parameters. You could also import from, you know, traditional uh, SysX files from TX81Zs or DX7s. It has kind of the whole engine of Halion. It also has the FM uh, X engine, which is from um, uh, like the Montage keyboard and the, the original DX7. So if you wanted to even, you know, come over to, you know, let's say when we go to different, um, you know, frequencies, you could just even come over to pitch and choose, you know, whether you want it to be an actual, what the sound source would be of the different engines. There's new tails instrument, which is kind of like Verve for acoustic guitar, um, you know, and a zillion little things like, you know, you now have kind of an envelope, like a shaper envelope for making envelopes, you know, so there's kind of, I'm still learning it myself, but, uh, but the ability of being able to, you know, detach different windows, new licensing, you know, easier to find sounds. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the macro creation. So if you're making your own instruments, so it's a massive update for Halion 7. So it's a quick, quick overview. But check out some of Dom Segalis' videos. He did some great videos on that. Uh, so we see John Barry. Uh, hi, Greg. Is the content for Halion 7 still on the dongle? Uh, there may be a couple of third-party libraries, but I think most of them have migrated to the new Steinberg licensing. All of the included content is on the new licensing system. So there's a whole slew of new instruments that have migrated over to the new licensing system as a result of the release of Halion 7. And there will be a trial version of Halion 7 soon. Okay, Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button. It allows us to continue to do these live streams. Okay, so we see, uh, hello, I recently exported some tracks uh, using multiple, and when I went back to the original session, I found that the source tracks were missing. Uh, where did I go wrong? How do I restore those tracks? Um, so usually there's nothing, like if you're doing kind of like a, you know, multi-export where the, you know, particular tracks are that would really uh, cause the tracks to go missing. Um, so maybe it was something else that was kind of independent 
of the export audio. Um, like sometimes I've seen people that will, you know, export multiple tracks and then they delete the original and realize that, you know, maybe there's still files. Uh, if you open up your project, try going to your pool window. And if you have missing files, you'll probably see it indicated here. Make sure that they didn't get put into the trash. So you can, you could, you know, if you have a file that's in the trash, you can take it out of the trash into the project and that may restore it. But I would check there just to make sure that they didn't accidentally, I think there's going to be a, an independent action that caused the files to not be there. But look in the trash because that's where they're going to go to first place is kind of a safety measure. Uh, and see if the f the files are in there. And if you could let me know if it's tracks that are missing, like an entire track versus uh, a just like an audio file in a track. And sometimes when you do the export audio mix down, you have the option to um, after export maybe to you could create a new project. So make sure that that wasn't. Maybe you're opening up the new project as opposed to the old one as well. So check, you know, on the after export, maybe it went to a different location or a different folder. That happened. That could happen sometimes and throw people off. All right, so we see uh, how to automation delay. So let me just jump here to revert this. All right, so you know if you wanted to automate like a delay for a particular track. So let's say if we're here. Okay, so let's say I have vocals. All right, so I'm just going to add an effects channel to this. So there's two ways to approach it. One is to come right over here. Let's get to our effects channel. Let's just throw like a mono delay on. All right, so let's make it, let's say a dotted quarter note delay. So as we play. So when we come to our send effects, So we could automate the track. So I'm going to come here and just grab the delay. So now if I just want to play that back, we can see that the delay is automated. Now, another way that people often use if you just want to do like a quick delay throw is if we just grab this and I'm just going to hit F7 and that will open up my, uh, you know, my uh, direct offline processing and we could just say, okay, I just want to throw a delay. So it's like a quarter note delay on this selected file. So I'm just going to come here. And we could add a tail if we wanted to. So I'm just gonna say, let's add a quarter note delay and let's uh, extend the process range. So now I'm just going to, as we process like this particular file, we can now. And I'll just kind of turn off the effects here. So. Let me listen to this. And let's say for this one, I wanted a, you know, a mono delay, but I want it to be half note delay. So now we can listen to it. So you can hear how it kind of cuts off, then you could just kind of process uh, more time on that. So let me know if that's kind of what you want it to do. Let me just remove my lovely processes here. And you could remove these at any time after the fact. All 
All right, so we see uh, can Halyan 6 and 7 access Groove Agent's sample library? Uh, also, are there any plans for Yamaha Motif sounds to come to Halyan? Um, so right now, you know, I think Groove Agent uses kind of the same underlying engine, but Groove Agent sounds play back in Groove Agent. Um, as far as Motif sounds coming into Halyan, um, it's been like that for a long time. So a lot of the Halyan Sonic SE sounds are um, already, you know, came from the Motif library. So, you know, that's that's been in place for a number of years. Um, but I think now that we kind of see this integration going on, that we may, you know, hopefully see future stuff like that between uh, the two teams as well. I know that, you know, they use the products interchangeably quite a bit. So I think we'll see, you know, I could speculate that, you know, that that would continue into the future. Okay, so we see Rude Screen is from the UK. He's is like number 85. Thanks for joining us and thank you for hitting the like button. Okay, so we see, uh, is there any way to assign the media bay output um, to other than main mix? So, you know, I'm not sure if you saw this earlier, but you could have it automatically go um, to the headphones channel. So if you go into your media bay and configure the headphones under the audio connections, so you see like a phones category here. And then as you're doing the media bay previews, come over here to, once again, go to control room and just activate use phones channel as preview option right here. And then you could send it to somewhere else. All right, so we see uh, DL White just says the spin FX is a DJ record spinning FX and filter. Um, so check to see if it's uh, maybe like, uh, you know, it might be using some of the content maybe just from, if you get to Loop Mash FX. So this will have like some different uh, plugins for, you know, taking audio, chopping, spinning, and doing DJ style effects with that. So maybe it's in Loop Mash FX, but probably if you uh, import your project from Cubasis into Cubase, uh, see if you know it's automatically populated with a particular plugin. All right, wonderful CPZ 136 on. All right, so we see a question. Uh, hi, how can we edit uh, information on artist and set up result columns of the retro log, for example, and how to enter this information artist, for example, when creating presets? Thank you. Um, so if you are wanted to come over here, let's say, uh, let's go to like our full media bay and let's take a look just at uh, VST sound. Okay, so let's say we wanted this to incorporate like a field for artist. Uh, so if we want it to just click on the settings category, so we go come over here, we could just say, um, there's probably a field for artist already. Yeah, so you could just say, okay, I want artist to be incorporated as a possible potential field, so we'll click on the settings cogwheel again, and now we can see for every preset, you can now enter uh, an artist name, and then you could search for presets by, by, you know, by artist as well. So, um, so once again, you know, just come to Media Bay, and then you'll see artist, right here under staff, and then you could just have that as a field that you could enter and search by for different presets. Uh, 
Okay. All right, so um, I see for granular t question, uh, for granular tasks, uh, how does PadShop 2 and Halion 7 compare? So there is a new granular oscillator that was just developed for Halion 7. I haven't had a chance yet to compare it to PadShop 2, but I think it is a new, uh, a new tool. So there is a brand new uh, granular oscillator. So I think it you know, may be more advanced than PadShop 2 at this point. But I, I can't say for sure, but I know that was one of the new features in Halion 7. All right, so we see from uh, Little Wing Audio, uh, within the Cubase Artist 12 using the score editor, how do we change the time signature to have more than one time signature? Um, so I think that this would be the same in Artist. Uh, let me just take a look, see if we come here, let's just say. Okay, so at this point, um, so I know, you know, if we're inside of Cubase, you know, Cubase Artist doesn't have as much scoring features, but let's say if I have a signature track in my project, so let's get to a signature track here. I'm gonna activate it, sorry. So it's activated signature track. And we're gonna say at this point in the song, you know, I want it to go to three, four, Back to four four. So now, if we want to look at the score here, let's see if it's reflected. Let me just find the. Yeah, so you'll see four four three four, then going back to four four. So it's all with your signature track. And if you don't have a signature track, um, I think if you hit Control plus T, that you could add the time signatures here. So uh, let me know if it's like just changing time signatures or if you want it. You know, so I don't think you're going to be able to do like a compound time signature, like three plus two plus three. You know, three plus two you know, two plus three plus two over eight, but you can in Cubase, um, in Cubase Pro, you could have compound time signatures. See Gerald Ely just says tempo from tapping gives me an idea, so that's good. See Gareth is going to feed his daughter. We'll see if it's pizza or five guys night. All right, sorry, my chat field just jumped. All 
All right, so we see uh, from Jeweler to Rocket, um, how can I set the output to go to my headphones only uh, when I'm using Apollo Twin through Cubase? Thanks. Um, so it's really, you know, it could be, you know, some audio interfaces, I don't have an Apollo, uh, but some they're gonna be just tied together. Um, so if you drop the volume on the main, Headphone, if you drop the volume on the main, um, if it's, you know, coupled, so it may be fixed together. Um, so, you know, some audio interfaces, you have the headphones go out of like outputs three and four so that you could, you know, have the speakers on one and two and the headphones on a different bus. Um, but it, if it's a kind of a simple two in, two out style interface, it may be just linked together and there's nothing that Cubase could really do if the interface doesn't allow that. So it could be a limitation of the Apollo interface, but you know, see if you could, and sometimes within the control panel for the audio interface, you could see it there as well. Uh, so we see uh, from Chris Hallam, wonderful to see you on the live stream. Um, so it would be amazing to have Dorico's melodic and rhythmic transformation, such as inversion, retrograde, uh, as logical editor presets in Cubase. So you could do some of it already. Um, yeah, I mean, there could be more, but you know, if we wanted to, let's say, let's look at this bass line here. And let's say I wanted to use um, B1 as my point to do like you know an inversion let's see if i can remember how to do this in a logical editor so let's get to set up i want to take midi notes and we're going to transform these let me move these so let's say um we're going to take value one and let's see if we do and let me see if we could set this to mirror. And then let's put it at 64 and then hit apply. Let me just do it for all the notes. Um, so you could choose to, let me see if I have just a preset. I may have made one. Uh, like an inverted retrograde. So let's say, okay, so I'll open this up and yeah, so I, I'm just gonna choose to mirror around C3. So if you want it, let's say I wanna do this around B1. Let's try that. So you could do, you know, some stuff like that as well. So there is some stuff, but yeah, I, I think it would be nice to have kind of just, you know, to take those same principles that they have in Dorco, I think are really slick and use that inside of Cubase. But there are some stuff you could do within the logical editor is already, Chris, that you could explore. So try the mirror function. All right, so we see Tim Weinheimer's stepping up his piano practice to get better. I need to do that as well, so. All right, so you think best Korean Jesus got it, has it figured out with the, um, with the randomizing inside of FX modulator. All right, so we have uh, Lucy Godfrey checking in from London. So glad you could make it today. Thanks for joining us, being part of the community.
All right. Uh, so we see, uh, please show how you would check phase on two mics that recorded one signal, uh, preferably using supervision to fix the phase. All right. So we just go to different project here. Okay. So I get some acoustic guitars. It'd be good for this. All right, so let's say, I'll just pan this here quickly. Okay, so let's come over to supervision. And, you know, let's say we wanted to come over here and just kind of check the overall phase. So one of the ones that's really helpful is kind of if we go to the multi-correlation. Because here we could actually see particular frequencies. I'm gonna just take this file here. Let me just loop around this. All right, and I'll just go to my processes. So now I just flip the phase. So now we can see like that we have a you know significant phase issue here. So the what we see in blue is in phase, what we see in red is out of phase. So if I was to remove that. So again, if we come over here. And if we're to look at this also now in our phase scope. And let's look at it. In our correlation, we could kind of see when we see it in red like that. And we'll come over here to delete. So in the blue is good, but the multi-correlation is a really fantastic tool because you can see the particular frequencies that are out of phase. So again, just come over here to the process. And that gives you a really clear indication. So, but that so that should help with that. All right, Michael Teams wants people to smash the like button. All right, and Gareth wants people to lick the like button. Hopefully before, hopefully after smashing. All right, all right. You see, Anders McCormack says YouTube needs a multi like button, so that would be okay with me. You could sign in on a different account, maybe, just to hit like. Have your friends sign in and hit like. All right, uh, so we see a uh, question. Can you please show how, again, VST Transit work? Uh, need to send an entire project to another studio, Cubase 12 Pro. So again, come over to the VST Cloud. Let's go to VST Transit. You need to log in with your My Steinberg account. So. password again, sorry. All 
All right, and here what you need to do is just say, okay, I wanted to uh, upload particular projects. So you click here, and then I wanted to upload this project. You could do just particular tracks, make it visible, make it invisible. I, you know, I want them to upload everything except this particular track, and then invite your friend and share the project with them, and then they could download it, tweak it, make their changes on one track or multiple tracks, and then it could just kind of work in sync that way. Okay, um, all right, so a question. Um, so you see, it is from Jose Antonio Gazzo. Um, says, uh, says, Greg, you asked me to rephrase my question. I'll try to, uh, sorry for my English. I'm sure, you, you know, uh, I'm the ignorant one who only speaks English. So my apologies for not being multilingual. All right, so the question is, uh, in the project editor, MIDI tracks show a whole range of octaves. Would like to see only one row, one note. Um, all right. Uh, if you increase the track height, you'll notice that the MIDI information track has a lot of unused space. That's the reason behind it. All right, so let's say, um, all right, so let's say I look at my MIDI data here. So if I make it like that, So I don't know if, um, so it shows a whole range of octaves. Would like to see only one row, one note. If you increase the track height, you'll notice that the MIDI information track uh, has a lot of unused space. Now one of the things, if you have unused space here, uh, like when you get to the top, you know, one of the things you could do is a preference. Um, like when you get to, I think it's under editing, maybe, or maybe event display, show event names. Let's see if that has an impact on it. So I think it does leave, you know, some space there for names, um, but I, I don't think it will show just kind of a single row of MIDI. Um, but I think it kind of makes sense the way it is, but I understand if others don't think that way. All right, so we see X Cubase X. Well, I couldn't help myself. Upgraded absolute five to six, installed now, so. And Nick is lost in Halion 7 as he types. All right. That's great. You made a good choice with your prize selection, Nick. All right. All right. So we see a um, question. Uh, how do you re-render multiple files in different sample rates bit depths within Cubase? So really all you have to do is when you go to export audio, um, like if we render internally, you know, it's going to render to the same sample rate and bit depth as a project so that it doesn't play out of tune and out of time. But we go to your audio mix down, we can say, okay, I wanna take like my stereo mix uh, and I want it to be a 44.1 stereo interleaved. Let's make it 24 bit here. Uh, so now I'm gonna click on add to cue. Uh, I want this to be a 48K um, 24 bit file. Add to queue. I want this to be a 16-bit 44.1 file. Add to queue. I want this to be a 24-bit 96K file. Add to queue. And then we could just come over here and start the queue export, and that will take, we could do this on individual files or a whole mix down, but at this point we could have different sample rates and bit depth combinations. 
so that and you could do it all at once and have it go to specified folders that you designed or allocated right here for and each queue each each export within a queue can be uh, completely into different folders as well. So just do it from the batch export or just create uh, export queues. And if you don't see the export queues, you just kind of want to go to this little window here and just make sure that the export queues are visible. So that's how you can do it. Let me know if that's helpful. All right. All right, so we see Little Wing Audio got his Zoom uh, VST plugin working, so it's great. Let's see, Richard Starr asks, what am I going to have for dinner? Um, I don't know yet. Uh, my wife uh, is working late. I have, a, right after the live stream, I have a meeting for an hour and a half, and then I have to do my, um, I have to do the index straight after that. So it's going to be probably 11, 1130 when I'm finishing up. So I may just grab something quick. So I haven't had time to think of dinner yet. So, But it may be soup. Maybe uh, Michael Pierce could give a recipe. All right, so we see from Fernando, just says, unbelievable work you're doing, Greg. Thank you so much. Just glad it's helpful for people, and I get to learn stuff too. All right, uh, it's a wonderful to see David M. on. Glad you can make it from Liverpool. All right, so we have uh, Sorna's question. It says, uh, if I have all tracks routed to mix bus and that goes to stereo out, if I drag a loop or sample, it gets routed to stereo out, but, but I want it to mix bus. Uh, is it possible? So when you drag it in, it you know it's going to be routed to the stereo out so that it knows it's going to sound. Um, but you know once it's in there, and you could, you know, if you do this a lot, one of the things you could do is just to make a uh, project logical editor preset. Um, so if we go to uh, the project menu, go to project logical editor preset, you could say I want to take. Uh, you know, the selected track. So we'll say media type is, uh, we'll say container type is set to track. And if we have transform selected here, um, we could go to uh, track operation and then you could just choose uh, connect output and then you could just have it go directly to a particular, you know, mix out or stereo mix out. Let me just, um, yeah, so you could just send it to mix bus and every, anytime you do it, you could just have a button that just sends it to mix bus so you don't have to uh, set it manually if needed. Okay, uh, so we have a question. Um, I have markers set so that I could jump uh, using the number keys. When I open a VST instrument, it takes over the keyboard focus. Uh, is there still a way to be able to make jumps between markers? Um, so a lot of times it could be, um, so let's say I have markers set here. So I think it's um, like if I go to like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, so you might, um, so, and if I hit like N and B, I could go to next and previous marker to do this. But let's say if we go to our focus window, um, so let's take our focus away and go to, let's say groove agent. So if this is our active window here, let me just minimize, let me just restore that. I'll just go to, I 
Okay, so let's say I come here and now still when my VST instrument is the active window and I hit like four, five, six to navigate on my numeric keypad, it's automatically going to the particular markers for me. So I'm not sure like what marker keyboard shortcuts, but if you're using like three, four, five, six, you know, seven, eight, nine, so one and two will set the left and right locators. Three will go to marker three, four to marker four, and this is all on a numeric keypad. So even if this is the active window, hitting those, the marker navigation still works for me. Um, but let me know if it's, you know, some plugins may take over, you know, different, uh, you know, may take keys as it's in focus. Uh, but, you know, just using the navigate to those markers using the numeric keypad seems to work regardless of what the focus is. Okay, reading through questions. All right, hang on just a second. All right, I'm back. All right. Okay, uh, all right, reading through questions. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. We hope that everyone is learning a new tip or trick. All right, so we see a question from Sam Brown. Uh, when I'm horizontally zoomed out all the way, the skinniest setting in a mixer window, I have trouble expanding uh, and contracting the different racks. I end up accidentally clicking preset management and fix. Okay, so let's say we're in ours. I'm just gonna hit G and H. Um, and I'll just add a number of tracks to see if that changes the zoom scaling on it. Okay, so, you know, so let's say I'm here, let's say, all right, so that's the, most I could zoom in, um, say horizontally zoomed in all, or zoomed out all the way. Uh, I have trouble expanding, contracting the different racks. I end up accidentally clicking preset management. Um, so you probably maybe. Okay, so I see where it's kind of over here. Um, so I would maybe, you know, so I'm not sure if yours looks smaller than this, but if you just kind of err on the side of the power button, you know, I think that that, you know, instead of going for the middle, but, you know, I've seen different editing, editing scenarios where and I think that only shows up, like, if, you know, if you hover, let's see what the, so if I'm here, You know, so it doesn't seem to be so, you know, I can see where, let's say if we go to maybe, but I would aim, I don't know of a, you know, a, a good solution other than maybe just aiming to the right of the power button. 
you know, and see if you could do that as well. So, but I know that if you're running different resolutions that it may be even smaller than that. So. All right, so we have Lawrence ask, uh, is there a way to make the talk uh, about in the control uh, in the control room momentary? Um, so I used to have just kind of like a foot switch to do it. Let me just see. Um, there are some preferences for the control. So let's go to our control room. Um, and... You know, one of the things that I uh, I have it set up for is like the talkback is disabled uh, once we're in record. So I think let me just set a, a, a MIDI remote command for the talkback here. So I'm going to go to the MIDI remote. Okay, so I want this button here to toggle the talk back. You just try from uh, key commands. So talk back on and off. So I'm gonna All right, so that will stay on until now let me see if I could with the controller uh to toggle it. Let's just see if I... Let's see if we could change the behavior of that. I say that there is like a way to get that to toggle on. So it's kind of an on off situation currently, but I think that there is a way to, and I'm just having kind of a brain cramp on it now that it, 
maybe when we define the So like maybe when you define the button here, so let's say, okay, I'm gonna click here and let's add. So let's see if there's, um, yeah, but you know, the one thing that I do is if the talkback is turned on, as soon as you hit play, you could have it automatically disengage and disable as soon as you're in play or record. Um, but I think that there's a way, and I'll see if I could get it for Tuesday's live stream, Lawrence. Um, so that you could just have it disabled when you're in play and record. And only had to talk back like while you, while you're you know paused per se. But I'll see if I could get that sorted out for Tuesday's live stream. Sorry about that. All right. So we see. Um, can you mix uh, quadraphonic audio out using MIDI control from? your synth controllers. So yeah, you could, you know, if you come over here, we could have um, like a joystick or an XY pad. So if you want to add like an XY pad on your controller, and then we could set different messages for, uh, you know, for your X and Y axis, and then you could have that control panning. Um, so uh, it may not be as accurate as, you know, like a joystick, but you can map it out through the uh, MIDI remote system. And let me try just one other quick thing with the MIDI. Um, you, know, you might be able to, let, let's see if I could do it with just a quick MIDI note for the, in the MIDI remote for the talk back. So let me see if I go to my generic remote. Just add in our generic remote here. Okay, so I want to use this uh, for my panorama. So let's learn this particular MIDI note. Doesn't seem like my panorama is, maybe it's being used for something else. Um, I think I'm using it for another MIDI remote, but you might be able to do it through the generic remote to toggle it, but I'll play around with it some more, Lawrence, and show it on Tuesday. All right, so we see, um, Just see another question. My chat field just jumped on me. All right. How do I activate send and pan level in the metronome in the control room? Uh, so let's say we go to the main tab and we have them. Um, so right now we can see uh, we'll have our main settings here and there's an insert tab at the bottom and the main tab. So click on the main and that will bring up additional functions. And one of those will be the click level as well as the click panning, according to just like that. All right, I know we had a couple questions that were mailed in, so I'm gonna get to those. Thanks for everyone's patience, and thank you for all the wonderful questions that everyone has sent over. 
All right. Uh, we will let me just jump to my questions. All right. So one question we had uh, last week was how to automatically delete gaps between events on the project window. And I was trying to create a macro and uh, there's a couple, two different approaches that we could do for this. So let's say we have a number of files directly here on our project window and I'll just revert to this quickly and they have a gap and I just want to get rid of the gap on all of the events. Um, so one way to do it is if I select all of the events and I can just hold down shift and double click and then I'm going to hit down, hit control or command and deselect the first one. We could switch our grid to shuffle mode. And now I'm just going to drag these over and now the gaps between all of the events will be eradicated. So again, uh, you want everything selected except for the first event. And we can come over to shuffle mode from grid and just drag over the event next to it. And as we do that, the gaps will be gone. Now, if you wanted this to be automated, um, what we could do is come over here and uh, I created a project logical editor preset. And so if you wanted to fire this off, from a particular logical editor preset. Um, and this has preconditions and post conditions. Uh, so we'll just say, um, I think I saved it as, just find the name of the preset. Let me just. All right, so I think I have it as my logical, I think I saved it in my MIDI remote settings. All right, so it's gonna be snap event to previous. All right, so I have the name. All right, so if you wanna do this where you could fire it off from a controller, so it's gonna be snap event. All right, so we could say we want to switch the, and this is assuming that we're in grid mode so we're going to before we do anything it's going to switch it to shuffle and then we're going to take all of our audio tracks and we're going to say position beyond cursor and then we're going to say property is sent to the parent object is selected and then on a post process we want edit move to cursor then we want to select no events we want to locate the next event and then we're going to turn our our snap back to grid so when I do this, to start this off, we want to actually be on the, at, we're gonna start with the track selected. So we don't want this to do it for all events. Uh, so now when I hit the button on the MIDI remote, so I'm just gonna hit this particular button, we will now just automatically move the events over. So if you wanna hit one button, to automate that entire process, you could do it like so. So that would be all you'd have to do. And again, I know this is convoluted, um, probably the dragging it over with shuffle mode, but if you had to do it with uh, a keyboard shortcut, you could use this particular preset as a project logical editor preset. All 
All right. Uh, so we had a question. Uh, hi, Greg. I'd like to have an insert effect on a vocal track. Example, chorus, distortion, stereo width. How can I raise the effects based on the loudness of the vocal track? Unfortunately, it's difficult to explain this um, in 200 characters. Uh, could you show this on Friday's stream? So one of the things that I was working with on this is um, if we have a vocal track here. So let's say I have this going into... Oh. A reverb so we have this going into our revelation reverb and let's say I only want like particularly loud sections of this to fire off the reverb so only loud sections I want the reverb to open but on soft sections I don't want reverb so what I did is I went to the particular uh, effects return channel the reverb return channel and let's open up the inserts uh, and as we do this, I just went to the gate. And what I've done is I've set up a side chain of the gate to the vocals. And we set the value of the side chain. And I put kind of a long attack time on it. So if we listen to this now, probably at this value, it's going to be dry. So now if I wanted this to, if I made this track louder uh, and let me make sure I had the side chain correct here uh, na, 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 na. all right so let's say we'll just come na, here na, 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 na. Let's say this one's going to be louder. Where is home? Are we there yet? I think let's make this one overall louder and have it fade in. So as the tracks are louder, they will trigger and open the reverb. What dimension am I in? So let's make, we'll just go back. What dimension am I in? But a softer track won't open it up and the louder track will open up the reverb so we could side chain tracks into the particular um so now what dimension am i in but let's say we want this to be softer tracks are dry louder tracks have reverb softer tracks so again, placing a gate on the effects return channel and doing a side chain of that gate to the effects, we could open up the effect uh, as you're working um, to have that particular effect uh, turn on as tracks get louder. Okay, so, um, so we see in our question, uh, Will the beats per minute uh, BPM sync work fix when I place a beat without automation? I can't sync a beat right. So let's say we have just a, a random beat that we don't know what the time, uh, what the tempo is of a particular beat. So I will jump, let's just jump here to this project. And let's say I don't know what the tempo is of a particular beat. All right, so I'm going to drag, um, we'll create a quick drum beat here. All right, so we drag. All right, so we, and we listen to this, I'm going to render it and Let's say we're going to say, okay, let's make it, we're at 80, we're 65 uh, beats a minute. So I'm going to render this particular file. So we'll go to edit to render in place. So we'll get to our render settings. We'll do our complete signal path uh, and let's mute our source events. All right, and I will not have it selected, record enabled this time. I hate when I mess up. OK, 
Okay, let's say I'll just take this one. So let's say I have a particular loop. Um, you know, really one of the things that you could do if you want it to fit is just to have that loop in musical mode. So let's say I don't know uh, what the tempo of this loop is. So I'm gonna come here. And we could count the number of beats. So you could say, you know, like one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. I'm gonna turn off the metronome. Three, four, two, two, three, four. So we have eight beats in this particular loop. And if we wanted to figure out how, you know, what tempo that was, we could now come over to project and go to beat calculator. And we could say, okay, this is eight beats and it's gonna give us a tempo of, it's 120. Uh, so we come over here, uh, let me just, so we can see right now we type in the number of beats. You know, we said this is seven beats, it's 105 beats a minute. We have eight beats, it's 120 beats a minute. And what we need to do is to go into our pool and we could select the particular file and as we do this, we could just say, okay, we want to see the particular tempo. And if you don't see a tempo value here, type in like 120 beats a minute, and then you could activate musical mode. So we could click here, and now that it's activated into musical mode, whatever tempo we have, this loop is going to follow and lock right in to the tempo and follow whatever tempo change we have as we had kind of drawn in tempo changes here. We'll just bypass that and say, let's make it 100 beats a minute playback. Let's make it, um, you know, like 159 beats a minute. So now it's always going to kind of sync directly to the project tempo with that. All right, let me jump back to our live questions. Thanks for all the great questions from everyone. All right, we see we're at 118 likes. Thank you very much. All right. All right, let me find my spot. All right, we have Tony Hutspeth just saying hi. So thanks for joining the live stream today. Reading through comments. All right, so we see from Tony, uh, where can I find how to align a badly played bass to a kick timing, like a quantized thing? I remember there was a feature that did this, but it was years ago, Cubase 12 Pro. Um, so really, you know, once, anytime that you record audio into your system, it's actually going to figure out like where the hit points are on a particular file. So uh, at this point, if you want to quantize, you know, so if you need to, like if the whole bass part is just like completely out to lunch, we could select the event and go into the project window here and say, okay, I want to quantize this to eighth note to make sure that audio warp is turned on. And then you could just, as we zoom in, so let's say we want to undo the quantize. So we say, let's quantize to eighth notes. We could just have the part. And where we were before. 
before so it's not too bad but that's an easy way of doing it now sometimes you may have like let's say the bass player just totally missed a downbeat um this is when like the new warping the free warp comes in handy because we go to our warping tool select free warp and then we could put in kind of like warp markers and sometimes it's good to put them in like before or after you could also from the hit points come over here let's just undo those but if we go to our hit points um we go to audio to real-time processing and we say convert create warp markers and now we could just say oh that was like i wanted that they came in really late here i want this and you could just kind of move the audio performance uh like you would you know as easy as midi for a lot of timing irregularities so this is what i often do in guitar and bass parts and vocals you know to kind of tighten it up so you're just like oh you know they just missed this one boom just knock it right in place and you could have it automatically snap to the grid so as we do this and zoom in let's say i want this to uh snap and you'll see that it'll just kind of fall into like a little hole if you will so we could just snap that hit point right to the grid like so All right, see so yeah, how we're doing on time. All right, doing great. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Okay, so we see Little Wing Audio says he monkey hammered the signature track and saw the changes in the score editor, so it's great. All right, so we see from Steve Green, uh, would improving my graphics card help stop Cubase crashing occasionally? So often, you know, you know, you don't want like a super duper, you know, complicated graphics card. You just want something that's capable of, you know, outputting the graphics data because, you know, that's not the highest priority on the system. So sometimes even rolling back to like a basic set of graphics drivers could help improve, you know, what's needed for the games, uh, for gaming performance is, you know, kind of the opposite of what you want for stable audio performance. So, you know, if you have like an NVIDIA card, see if you could just, you know, get it to the point where uh, everything is running as basic as possible and you'll probably get better performance that way. Okay. Sorry, my son's playing soccer outside my office door. All right. Uh, so we see, uh, hey Greg, I uh, hope you're well. Is there a way for me to route an output to my iPhone speakers using the control room? So I know that there are some devices that you could take a, um, you know, take the audio outputs from a from an audio interface, and you know, maybe and they're often like three and a half millimeter, like the small headphone jacks, and they transmit Bluetooth. So if you have a way of getting the audio into this device, there's little devices are like twenty dollars on Amazon. I have one, um, and then that will take the audio signal and then automatically have it routed out from your audio interface that would generate Bluetooth audio that you could listen to. Um, it will be slightly delayed, so, and you may be limited on the sample rates that you use, but it can be done, but not just like, you know, we're just gonna, you know, they're both on the same network, we could do it, or the, they're connected via Bluetooth because the clocks aren't gonna be synchronized. So get a little device that you could take the audio out and convert that into Bluetooth and you know like the device i have goes both ways so all right all right wonderful Let's see you see uh vagularin back on i'm sure i pronounced that wrong let's go ahead and thanks for being on we've got a couple more minutes All right, so we see from John Costigan says uh, phase reverse a track on multivision, multi correlate on supervisions, multi correlation to test phase is his revelation of the day. So that's good. 
All right. Uh, hello, Greg. Do you know why my Cubase project is pausing when opening another window, let's say the internet browser? So it could be that you have to go into and toggle this settings. So if you come over here, uh, let's say if you come over here, there's a release driver when application is in background. So if you're running a different sample rate than what your web browser is using sometimes, if you're using the same audio interface, um, at that point, you know, it may be switching sample rates and changing the clock of your audio interface to switch the sample rates from what Cubase is using to what your web browser is using. Okay, so we have a question from Steve Green. Um, how do I cut part of an event? Uh, this, how do I cut part of the event, the start of the event, just say at one minute, 28, um, at one minute, 28 seconds, and then locate it exactly at 147 on another audio track? Okay, so let's come here. So let's say I cut this particular event here. Um, Okay, so we're just looking, and I will switch this to seconds for my time. So let's say right now the start of this event is 329. So let's say I wanted this to go, you know, so let's say I copy this. And let me just move it to a different track. So let's say I'm here. Um, so let's say I want this to be at 439. So I can just go 04. Um, dot 39. So, and at that point, you could just change kind of the start position so you could enter it in right here on the info field. So, you could just come right over here and just kind of enter in the particular time code value of when that event starts. All right, so we are out of time. I'm late for my next meeting, uh, but I want to thank everyone for being a part of the live stream today. Thanks for spending your afternoon, morning, evening with me. I uh, hope everyone learned some tips and tricks, and we will be doing it again on Tuesday. So everyone have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe and healthy, and we'll see everyone on Tuesday. Take care. Goodbye.